Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the house that Jack built. For those of you who do not know who I am, my name is David Yates. I'm the warden of the college and succeeded Jack Lewis to that post in 2001. When some of you arrived this, this afternoon, you might have noticed that our college flag is not flying at half-mast. Of course, it was so flying to mark and honor Jack's passing and funeral in July. But this afternoon, it is at full mast. And it's at full mast because the fellows took the view that this is not a day to lament the passing of a great man, although that, of course, is the reason why we're here this afternoon. But instead, it's an afternoon upon which we shall give thanks joyous thanks and celebration for the life of one of the country's most distinguished inorganic chemists, a university fixer, and one of the two people without whom this college would not exist. Our benefactor, Sir David Robinson, gave the university the money to build this college in an extraordinary act of philanthropy. Jack Lewis gave a significant part of his life, his wisdom, his energy, and his constructive spirit to making sure that that vision became the enduring and solid reality that it is. At the end of this service, I shall leave first with the members of Jack's immediate family out of the west door over there. Those of you in the auditorium, if you wouldn't mind please leaving by the rear exits to the auditorium. Everyone is invited to join the family and the fellowship for tea in the hall at the conclusion of this service. And there will be a book of remembrance on the hall balcony for those who wish to sign it. Could I please ask those of you who are staying for tea to hold back a little on signing the book simply so that those who need to leave immediately after the service have an opportunity to sign it before they go. It was my enormous honor and privilege to have known Jack and indeed to welcome you this afternoon to this service.
The Lord be with you. And also you. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Let us pray. Eternal God, Lord of life and conqueror of death, we give you thanks for the gift of life. Be with us as we remember and rejoice and comfort us in our moments of grief. Give us grace to worship you that we may have sure hope of eternal life and be enabled to trust in your goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, in, in your, your Son, Son, Jesus Christ, Christ you, have you have given us a true faith and a sure hope. Strengthen this faith and hope in us all our days, that we may live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. 
He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. I knew Jack Lewis for 56 years. I arrived in the UK from New Zealand in July 58 as a physical chemist to study for a PhD in inorganic chemistry with Ron Nyholm, the Australian doyen of this subject at UCL. I had not heard of Jack Lewis before I arrived, but in fact he had been at UCL for about six months then. He had graduated from Nottingham with a PhD in 52 and remained there for a further two years as a postdoctoral fellow studying liquid metals such as sodium and funded by Harwell. He was appointed a lecturer at Sheffield University in 54, uh, remaining for two years before moving on to become a lecturer at IC. Jack's lectures at IC were greatly admired. He got to know very well Geoffrey Wilkinson there and many American, UK and European professors of inorganic chemistry. Notable was Al Cotton of MIT, who regularly visited London while he and Wilkinson were co-authoring a text, Advanced Inorganic Chemistry, which went to many editions and proved to be highly influential on the subject. Jack was clearly, even at that stage, in the vanguard of modern inorganic chemistry. Ron Ny Nyholm noticed him from UCL and in late 57 poached him to UCL because he only stayed at IC for less than a year. Ron Nyholm was always exceedingly busy and Jack seemed to be charged um, with any day-to-day -day supervision of PhD students and postdoctoral fellows in Nyholm's group. In that way, Jack and I got to know each other very well and very quickly. My initial uh, task with Nyholm was to explore the coordination chemistry of the early transition elements, such as titanium. Jack's main research interest at that time lay with Brian Figgis, an Australian, in magnetochemistry and his application to the determination of valence and a bond type in coordination compounds. I realized that Jack was very knowledgeable, very fast moving academically, and a superb debater. We got into many discussions on the future of inorganic chemistry. What was worth developing further? What was curiosity driven? And what was simply stamp collecting? He and Ron Nyholm were great company at the regular Friday lunchtime colloquia at UCL. Debates on the significance of new results were openly explored in front of the whole inorganic section, often with great humor, especially if Ron and Jack happened to take opposing views on some subject. When Jack moved to the chair of inorganic chemistry at Manchester in 1962, he had barely turned 34. Beatrice and I visited Jack and Freddie at their home in Disley, and they came to our wedding in Darley Abbey. They, of course, had been married for many years then, having met on the dance floor as students at Nottingham. I continued to learn a great deal from Jack, not just on chemistry, but also on best practice in teaching, research, and administration notably when I became a head of department and dean of science. We were also both concerned with methods for the promotion and public understanding of science. Bodies such as the Royal Institution, where we both lectured, spring to mind. In Manchester, and later during his second period at UCL, from 67 to 70, Jack further investigated new organometallic metal metal bonded and metal cluster species. Much later in the 1980s, Jack's debating skills were carried seamlessly to the House of Lords, where he chaired the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution 
and several select committees on science and technology. His efforts there were greatly appreciated. Jack also acted as a referee for a great many appointments to academic positions at all levels and in many countries. Also for the award of prizes offered by societies and for elections to these um, societies. This was, of course, very time-consuming, but done very willingly. Of course, he received many awards himself from all over the world, including membership of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. It was a great pleasure for me to have nominated him successfully for two top UK awards, the Royal Medal of the Royal Society and the Longstaff Medal of the Royal Society of Chemistry. I carried out research over the past 50 plus years largely on different subjects and along different lines from Jack's, usually using different physical techniques. I think it was the complementarity of our research which created the lasting bond between us. Jack was one of the most perceptive and influential scientists of his generation as regards the new chemistry he developed and the influence he had on government policies. His encouragement of two generations of young scientists to make the most of their talents was outstanding. I viewed him as both a colleague and a friend. I miss him. I offer my sympathy to Freddie, uh, Penny, Ian and their families. <coughs> Yeah. 
Hello. Welcome to Cambridge. Are you settling in okay? Take care, lad. Hope the experiment next week goes well. These were the first and last words that Jack said to me, and I think they very much sum up Jack. Not only was he a great scientist with unbounded enthusiasm for gaining new knowledge and understanding, but he was also a caring person who took a real interest in the lives of his friends, colleagues, and students. The esteem and affection that Jack's colleagues and friends held for him is reflected in the large number of people here. Many of his former students and co-workers have travelled thousands of miles to show their respect to Jack, support for Freddie and the family, and to celebrate his life and achievements. So on behalf of the group, over the years, I'd like to spend the next few minutes paying tribute to Jack. Not only Jack, the leading scientist of his generation, but also Jack, the man, the mentor, the supporter, and the enthusiast. In all these aspects of his life, we should not forget Freddie. They came very much as a team. So let me follow on from Robin and say a few words about Jack's time in Cambridge. Jack moved to Cambridge in 1970 to take up the chair of inorganic chemistry, and this period proved to be one of the most productive of Jack's scientific career. Two of the chemical themes that he'd pioneered in the 60s blossomed in Cambridge, the reactivity of organic groups bound to metals and metal carbonyl cluster chemistry. Jack was among the first to realise the importance of compounds containing metal-metal bonds, principally with his work on ruthenium and osmium. But this work led to a general development of the chemistry of second and third row transition elements and the importance of these elements in the areas of homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis should not be underestimated. A recent survey suggests that heavy transition metal catalysts contribute over £250 billion to the UK economy. That's 21% of GDP. One wonders what this figure might have been if it had not been for Jack and a number of other enlightened chemists who enthused generations of researchers to study the chemistry of these elements, an area that really hadn't been looked at before Jack's pioneering work. Such was Jack's influence. Jack developed new areas of chemistry throughout his time in Cambridge. The work that he carried out on organometallic polymers set the benchmark for the introduction of metals in polymers for their use in electronics and LEDs. Subsequently, many leading groups have taken his work and expanded it, and Jack's innovation and influential research has facilitated these developments, and his contribution cannot be overstated. Working with Jack and Brian was a fantastic experience. John Evans, who started his PhD with Jack and Brian in 1970, comments that there was a special atmosphere of enthusiasm and optimism that allowed imagination to flow. There was a freedom to be inventive, and this was made possible by Jack's leadership and by the resources that he made available to the group. This was very much the situation when I joined in 1976. Jack was an inspirational leader. On most days, Jack made his rounds of the group first thing in the morning and late in the afternoon. He appeared, usually with a smile, always optimistic that you had some progress to report from the, during the day. And we all felt much better if indeed we had, did have something to report. <laughs> The last thing any of us wanted to do was disappoint Jack, and we strove to make sure that there was some new result, or at least progress towards a new result by the next time we saw him. Jack was always full of new ideas and suggestions and was able very quickly to rationalise perhaps why things had not worked and suggest a new route to desired goals. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of the scientific literature to guide us forward and a similar grasp of our activities, scientific or sometimes otherwise. 
Indeed, Jack was always very generous in promoting his research team. We were always encouraged to talk to visiting eminent scientists and discuss our latest results in a free and open way. Jack loved science and was happy to share his knowledge and understanding. Jack's worldwide reputation was reflected in the members of his group. More than half the research group came from outside the UK and represented all continents. A very important part of Jack's legacy has been that many of these researchers have gone back to their own countries and are now leading scientists influencing further generations of chemists. Throughout his time in Cambridge, Jack's influence in the sphere of UK science knowledge and policy was increasing, and he was, of course, involved in the development and foundation of Robinson College, and we will hear a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Jack's outstanding contributions have been recognised by many awards and prizes. Um, highlights of his career while in Cambridge include the award by the Royal Society of the Davy Medal for his outstanding work on the structure and reactivity of metal cluster compounds and the Royal Medal in 200, 2004 for his distinguished career in inorganic in, in organic chemistry over the last 50 years. He was knighted in 1982 and appointed to the House of Lords in 1989. His in this role, he represented science with his familiar drive and enthusiasm and also developed his interest in environmental issues. Jack remained an active peer until within a few months of his death and retained his exceptional intellect and sharpness of mind right up until his passing. Ten days before Jack died, I spent half an hour with him talking chemistry. He was as interested as ever in what I was doing, and we talked about upcoming experiments at a synchrotron, looking at dynamic processes in crystals, and coming full circle, we revisited the possibility of isolating osmium-35 clusters from a high-temperature synthesis that had been carried out many years before. This was a target compound that Jack had always predicted was present, but we'd never isolated or characterized. For me, this half hour will be an enduring memory, Jack generating suggestions about how to move the science forward, just as he'd been doing for the previous 35 years. I and many others here today owe Jack an enormous debt of gratitude. Not only was Jack one of the most innovative and influential chemists of his generation, but he also gave outstanding support to whole new generations of scientists those of us who have followed have been able to stand on the shoulders of a true giant. Thank you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me.
It must, I think, have been early 1976, the year I moved to Cambridge, when I received a telephone call inviting me to join a new college I'd never heard of. The caller was, of course, Jack Lewis. I turned him down. Taking on a demanding new post was sufficient challenge without helping to found a new college. He persisted, however. Come and see him when I visited Cambridge, he suggested. I remember only two things from that first visit. Small piles of brick awaiting a choice and Jack's enthusiasm. Before I knew it, I had been recruited as one of the first fellows of the new college. It was a decision I never regretted. When I joined the Robinson Project in early 1976, there were none of the famous bricks yet, just huge piles being driven into the ground on a vast building site. And beside the college officers, there were just three other fellows designate. Yet here we are, barely four decades later, in the midst of a richly varied and thriving community, an extraordinary achievement made possible, of course, by David Robinson's benefaction, but the life of the college is Jack's legacy. Few of us comprehend the enormous task with which Jack had been entrusted. The older colleges of Cambridge had evolved over centuries, growing slowly from small institutions to what they are today. This new college was to be built and set up in a space of five years. Jack had little time for relaxation, yet somehow seemed to have plenty of time to deal with minute problems. I remember spending one whole Saturday morning in his lab, helping to decide which door handles to have. <laughs> Not only did a large and complex building have to be constructed, but the whole social structure had to be put in place. Fellows, tutors, students, administrative, secretarial, domestic and gardening staff had to be appointed. Chefs and porters recruited. Statutes and regulations had to be drawn up. At the same time, he had to maintain good relations with the benefactor. Jack spoke to us two years ago at an alumni gathering about the problems he faced in liaising with both the trustees and the very demanding benefactor, demanding over both timetable and cost control in the inflationary mid-70s. Only as Jack spoke did we realise fully what sacrifices he and Freddie had had to make. For years they were unable to be out of reach or at any great distance from Cambridge. The personal cost was immense. Yet my memory of those early years of development is entirely positive, even joyful. It was thrilling to be part of such a huge new project, clambering over the building site in hard hats, and yes, even discussing those door handles. We had a lot of fun as things progressed, especially when our first enterprising students arrived, a handful of graduates in 1977 and a pilot intake of undergraduates in 79, then many more when we took over the new building in 1980. I have vivid memories of a first informal concert come review in the hall. Good-humoured satire was there right from the start and testified to the positive spirit Jack engendered around him. This has fed into a society that is still, I think, unusual in its friendliness and lack of factionalism, and I count that as one of Jack's greatest achievements but he was wonderfully and discreetly supportive where it was needed too, particularly to young academics who had their problems in the 1970s, and women especially. And I know many alumni came to be grateful for his lasting, active interest in them. It is very telling too that many staff have described him as a real gentleman. He knew them and their individual concerns, and they felt appreciated and valued. Underlying the practical decisions were important philosophical issues. Robinson, as it later became, 
was the first Cambridge College to admit both men and women undergraduates from its inception. Already we were breaking with tradition. What should be the characteristics of a new college in an ancient university? Did one simply copy the traditions belonging to the older colleges, go for quirky innovation, or attempt to steer a mid-course? Should we wear gowns, have a Latin grace at formal hall, have a separate high table, give undergraduates a share in the running of the college, involve spouses? Few of the first fellows had experience of other colleges. We needed patient guidance. It would have been easy for Jack to take all the decisions in those early days. Instead, he allowed us to discuss the issues. And as a result, college council meetings lasted well into the afternoon. Yet his relaxed attitude hid an underlying efficiency, something of which I became aware on one university committee of which I was a member and which he chaired. The meetings began 15 minutes after a seminar I was chairing was due to finish. I would thank the speaker, jump on my bicycle and rush across town, knowing that it was no use arriving a minute or two late. If I did, Jack would already have worked through the agenda and the meeting would be over. So what was remarkable about Jack's vision for the college was its modernity, married to respect for Cambridge tradition. At a time when other colleges were beginning to go mixed, and dare I say it, many crocodile tears were being shed about the difficulty of finding suitably qualified women, he managed to build a nuclear fellowship that was totally mixed and balanced in terms of disciplines, gender and age and open to both new and older ideas of what a college might be. Jack also brought us closer together through many social occasions, parties, barbecues, dinners, which we held at first in other colleges, then later when the first college houses were obtained on the site. Moreover, he and Freddie were well, warmly welcomed partners and often families too, something which was very unusual back in the 1970s. But Jack's vision was never just domestic. He also aimed at building up an intellectually active, open-minded academic community. And from the start, he attracted a variety of distinguished visitors from across the world, a great privilege and a lasting enrichment for such a young college. By carefully fostering that small group of founding fellows, Jack built up a spirit of friendly comradeship among us which has endured to this day. When the college was finally built and staffed, he apparently knew everyone, whether porter, gardener, cook or housekeeper. He possessed a genuine interest in everyone he met, together with an extraordinary gift of conveying the impression that he had all the time in the world to deal with their problems. Undergraduates too, both in the chemistry labs and in the college, were impressed that someone of such eminence had time to talk to them. Every member of this college owes an enormous debt of gratitude to its founding warden, for, as the words inscribed on the staircase, built in Jack's honour in this chapel express it, his wisdom shaped this college and made it what it is today. Perhaps I got to understand that wisdom most fully when, as his last deputy warden, I had to organise the election of his successor. No easy task. Jack was an absolute model of dignity and propriety, and it was a huge relief to me when I knew he felt we had chosen well. We could do no less for such an extraordinary man and pass on the college he had made into safe hands and continue working together now for its future.
And now let us keep silence as we gather together in this place which Jack loved and gave so much to. And as we remember him as husband and father and grandfather, as colleague and friend, and as the first warden of this college. And as we meet in community, in the silence, let us in thought or prayer give thanks for all he was and is to each of us. O oh Lord, God of life, we give you thanks for Jack, for all that he gave to each of us, for the good we saw in him, and for all that we received from him. We thank you for his friendship, his leadership, and his company, for his care, and for his encouraging smile for his contribution to the communities in which he worked, to the world of chemistry, and to this college shaped by his wisdom, in which many symbols of his presence speak his name. And as we give thanks for all that was good in Jack's life and for the memories we treasure, 
so, Lord, we commend him to your keeping. Look with mercy on us who miss him. Deal graciously with those who mourn, that, casting all our care on you, we may know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer of John Donne. Bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven. To enter into that gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling but one equal light. No noise nor silence but one equal music. No fears nor hopes but one equal possession. No ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity. In the habitation of thy glory and dominion, world without end. Amen. And now I invite those of you who wish here in chapel or in the auditorium to join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.